Welcome to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and we're excited to have with us today Dr. Mark E. Moore. Mark E. Moore. Mark is teaching pastor at Christ <laughs> Church of the Valley in Peoria, Arizona, where he cur- where there's currently eight locations and 28,000 in weekly attendance. He previously spent two decades as a New Testament professor at Ozark Christian College, and he's currently an online professor for Ozark, as well as an adjunct professor at Hope International University. Who about Hope International University? Where else is an adjunct But most professor? notably, most notably. Uh, Wheaton College Graduate School. <laughs> graduate School. Hey, Mark's also the author of many books, including his latest, Quest 52, a 15-minute a day, year-long pursuit of Jesus. But before we hear from Mark, let's go to Ed Setzer, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and the executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. I think somebody at Hope International University probably like, oh, when I said that, oh, you care? we all care about Hope International. We deeply care, but Wheaton College. So right. we just got to make sure that we do that. So we're for that. We're for that. Um, so good. So we're going to have a conversation uh, with Mark. And just for fun, just so people are aware, uh, over, right after Easter, Mark and I took a group of students to, uh, we went to uh, Rome, Athens, and Israel. Just, you know, we, we lacked the full desire to go to just one place. <laughs> and it was a New Testament course. And of course, you know, Rome and Athens is all about the disciples. Jesus went to neither of those places. But most of the trip was actually in Israel. And so I actually had the privilege of walking the footsteps the where Jesus walked with Mark Moore. So we talked a lot about Jesus, and this goes this is going to be a perfect conversation for us to talk about today. So, Mark, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Oh, man, and thanks for having me on that trip. That was uh, it, it was a, a, a mega exciting trip. It was indeed. It was indeed. We had super fun. Okay, so let's, let's talk about, um, because when we talk about Christianity, I think we naturally make the assumption that it's all about Jesus. I, when I speak at an event, I tend to tweet, pray we make much of Jesus. But, um, but it's very easy to make Christianity about, um, you know, what it, the doctrines, the beliefs, all of which matter, don't misunderstand, but what's the big, big, biggest obstacle in really getting to know Jesus, and why is that hard for people? Well, it's kind of like the, the trip we took. We, we were going to a foreign country where they spoke a different language, different cultures, different food, and often when we image Jesus, just reading him in the Gospels, we imagine him to look like the person we see in the mirror. And so some of the things that Jesus says that should be offensive to us, we just overlook or should be comforting to us. We, we overlook. Okay. So, um, so knowing Jesus is, I mean, I, I can think of like, uh, we want to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but I just recently had lunch. Some of our students had lunch with uh, Philip Yancey who wrote the Jesus I never knew or, or more. So this you're hoping and seeking to help people to know Jesus more fully. So what would it look like if we knew Jesus more fully as he really was? Mm, yeah, I, 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 that's a good way to put it, Ed, because I really want to be like a tour guide through the gospel narratives that we have, introducing you to when Jesus steps into a Pharisee's house, for example, what did that feel like? Because it, for us, we invite people over to dinner to get to know them, or we go out with a, a stranger, we date at dinners. You you don't do that in Jesus' day, that meals were reserved. This is just one example. Meals were reserved for people you knew that were at your same economic and social strata. So when Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners, that would be unheard of. We think of it as an act of compassion, but Jesus was actually changing the dynamics of who is inside and who is outside. So again, you could multiply that by, well, how about if we multiply it by 52 weeks of the year where we can look at one incident in the life of Jesus and observe him with a bit of commentary in his, in his native setting and try to put ourselves in his sandals or Birkenstocks, if you will, and and have a relationship on his terms rather than inviting him into our social media world and having a relationship with him on our terms. Hmm. Mark, you know, we're 2022, so we're obviously, you know, very far removed from the times in which Jesus lived. Um, how, how do we apply lessons from his life in his context to our modern day lives, especially in a way where we don't like misappropriate the culture, but hmm. in a way that we apply it um, appropriately to to our modern age. 
Well, that's obviously a tricky question, and we're all trying to figure that out in the church world. But one of the things that I've observed about Jesus is he didn't just break his own cultural values, he breaks ours. So applying his word is more about us bending to him rather than him bending to us. So for example, here's a simple one. Love your enemies. Likely the most offensive thing Jesus ever said. For us, it, again, it's 2022. Our enemies, we would probably, I don't want to offend anyone here, but we, we would think of Russia invading Ukraine and say, look at, look at what's going on over there. Their enemies were much closer to home. It would be like the Ukrainians being told to love the Russians. And even, even as I say that, it's like, wait a minute, you can't actually say that. But, but he did. So appropriating his, answering your question, appropriating his commands to us really means capitulating to his demands of us, that we love our enemies, that we take up a cross and follow him that we seek first the kingdom of God and not the goods and, and desires all around us. Yeah, when I, uh, I, I wrote, the only time I ever wrote in a secular publication about that phrase, Jesus love your enemies, was after the Boston Marathon bombing. Mm. And I wrote, love your neighbors, even your Muslim ones. And I never got so much hate mail or threats or thing, or, or, you know, just disapproval from Christians in general, such a countercultural message. So walk with us a little more. What are some other, and we're going to, let me, let me remind everyone too, the, the book we're talking about is Quest 52, a 15 minute a day, year long pursuit of Jesus it's on my desk right now. Um, and the conversation we're having is, is Mark in the book, he actually looks at different encounters with Jesus. So there's one that's pretty shocking, love your neighbors and applying it to something that's immediate and before us, what are some other examples of kind of jarring encounters that if we knew more fully what was going on, we'd walk more deeply in who Jesus is and, uh, and was and is for us today? Yeah, I, I'm thinking about, uh, Ed, you and I were in Magdala together, and they've yeah. just uncovered that, that synagogue. About 30 yards from that synagogue is a wealthy person's home that has a mosaic on the floor, that may actually be the place where the sinful woman anointed Jesus' feet in Luke 7. And so seeing those stone walls, you can just imagine a woman coming in and weeping over Jesus' feet. And because she wept with her, her tears or wiped it with her hair, that's the first part we wouldn't understand. Wiping someone's feet with her hair. We don't even understand what it means to wash someone's feet because we wear shoes but they're wiping it with her hair, and Jesus doesn't recoil from her. In our culture, and this is really quite extraordinary, we have compassion on the poor because whether we're secular or Christian, we have actually culturally adopted this world-altering value that those who are disenfranchised deserve compassion and respect. That's one example of where Jesus' teaching has taken over for our culture, and for us then to adopt that would mean, so let me put it in the church context now, what do we do with, quote, sinners? Typically, we respond by distancing ourselves from sinners, and Jesus would say, nope, you engage the sinner. So I, I remember we talked about this when we're walking together, Ed, that when Jesus touched the leper, he changed a, a, a philosophy that every religion had, that contagion or dirt, uncleanness was more contagious than cleanness. Hmm. And he flipped out on his head and said, no, cleanness is more contagious than uncleanness. Hmm. How many churches still have not learned that lesson? Because we're trying to avoid people who might contaminate us. That would be one example of a life offering principle that I think we need to apply. Mm. I, I like how you laid out the book because it's 52 um, you know, questions. And so it's you know really helpful to think about maybe one of these a week or something like that. Um, and I think you know, this is probably because of your New Testament background, but what do you think like right now, especially helping pastors and leaders think through this, what is it about the way that we understand Jesus culturally today that you think we might have wrong hmm. or maybe we're a little bit off? 
Well, it probably de depends on the denom denomination you're in. Uh, sure. I, I actually preached at a church in Louisville where they asked me to speak about the politics of Jesus, which mm. that's a popular topic everywhere, you know, <laughs> combine religion and politics in one sermon. And the statement, the statement I made there, I think is valid that if you want me to argue Jesus as uh, politically conservative to the right, I can totally point to passages where, where he is. If you want me to point to that he was politically to the left, all of us, we could go to those passages. And what we've done in the church is, is really gravitate one side to the other. And because of that, we have missed the value that the liberal left offers to the right and the conservative right offers to the left. Jesus' inclusion was not simply for rich and poor or for male and female. He had in his own discipleship group, uh, a group of disciples, Simon the Zealot sitting down with Matthew the tax collector. Well, you can only imagine the discussions around the campfire. That is, again, just one example of where I think church leaders have capitulated probably to the major donors rather than to those who are outside their orbit to the detriment of a holistic theology of both compassion and and um, and whatever the, you label you'd want to put on a conservative value of perhaps law and order or or justice. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think for a lot of people, um, the life of Jesus uh, then leads them to say, well, should I live that way? I mean, do I really do I wear the bracelet? What would Jesus do? Well, he'd, you know, live a sinless life, die on the cross, be raised from the dead in the third day. Um, so, but Jesus' actions are quite radical for his day and for our day, 2,000 years later. So how much are we seeking to be like Jesus? Um, how much are we seeking to uh, be as Christians who are shaped in a movement that was founded by Jesus? And is there a difference between those two? Am I, am I really just going to ask the question, what would Jesus do and do that? Or is there something more at work here? Well, and I, I love your tagline, let's make much of Jesus. Uh, I have a similar one where I often will say, let's make Jesus famous. Yeah. For me personally, if I exalt Jesus as the standard, it's kind of a North Star that directs my course, that I'm able to, to aim for that. And I want to be really specific as I say this. I'm aiming at Jesus, not merely for my, for my actions and ethical behaviors. I'm aiming at Jesus for my attitudes of self-reflection and introspection. Here, here's one that has been a real struggle for me, um, Daniel. I, I grew up pretty insecure as a young man. I, I think I've, I've, I've gained a little bit more self-confidence, but I was pretty insecure. Jesus' advice in Matthew 6, I wish I had mastered in my 20s and not my 40s, hmm. that instead of getting your esteem needs met, and they are needs, they really are needs. Instead of getting those esteem needs met from giving in public or praying a flowery prayer or fasting for people to see, just let the Father take care of it because your Father in heaven is concerned about your emotional and mental health. Hmm. And so I guess looping back to the question that Ed asked is, it is not merely for me about living a better life or being a, a good person that gets to go to heaven. It is finding my value in what Jesus valued rather than gaining my value from what I'm able to perform. And, and we guess a part of that is really understanding the context that Jesus was in, like for what it was and not trying to project like our modern day issues onto what Jesus was experiencing. And and want to follow up on what you're saying there, because I think for a lot of pastors in their sermon prep or even in their, their discipleship approach, um, you know, we resist getting deeper into Jesus's context and we try to pull Jesus forward into 2000 and try to apply him into our modern day context. But as a New Testament professor, somebody who, you know, has a deep knowledge of the New Testament, what's the value of pastors returning to really understand deeply Jesus's context? Yeah, it, for me, it's the difference between reading something in black and white or in living color, that you see 
Okay, so I know I'm talking to, to leaders and specifically preachers. If you want to preach a sermon that engages people with humor, Jesus was hilarious in his, in his own context. If you want to if you want to make a difference in people's lives, rather than just putting a frosting of 20, 21st century culture over it, showing the authenticity of Jesus, getting a little bit of the Palestinian dust on your toes makes it come alive in a way that I find invigorating. And Daniel, I can't tell you the number of people who have said uh, uh, about the history of it. People think history is boring. It absolutely is. I have not found it to be boring. Hmm. I've not presented it as boring. And when people see Jesus, it's like, it, it's kind of like when your dog sticks his head out the window when you're going 60 miles an hour. That's I mean, that's, you're feeling the energy of reality just rush at you through the Gospels. That's probably a terrible metaphor, but it's the best one I've got. No, let's track it with me. So um, again, just remind everybody, the book we're talking about is Mark's new book. It's Quest 52, a 15-minute-a-day, year-long pursuit of Jesus. I love the phrase, pursuit of Jesus as well. Um, you chose, obviously, 52 incidents. I mean, there's more than 52 incidents in the Bible, um, so or in the New Testament. How did you pick those 52 incidents? What's the framing? How do, how, do you, how do you say these are the ones that would speak to people? Well, they're, the, they're my favorites, actually. Fair <laughs> enough. That's, that's the simple answer. The, the a little more detailed answer is, as you see in the outline, I've categorized it in the person of Jesus, the, uh, the power of Jesus, his miracles, the preaching of Jesus, his principles, and the passion of Jesus, his sacrifice. Obviously, you can't say everything in one book that could be said, but I, I just pick these because A, uh, I like them, B, the synoptics tend to repeat them, C, I keep hearing preachers preach them because they, they tend to get traction with people. And I know everybody's different. They'll, they'll track with, with one story maybe over another, but it's I don't think I could have picked a bad passage, but these that I picked, I think, well, read, read the book. You'll, you'll, you'll feel the, the weight of the lion's roar of Jesus' voice. Yeah, no, I really, I found it helpful. And so uh, talk to me about Jesus preaching. One of the questions, not everyone who listens is a preacher, but a lot of them are. So it's pastors and church leaders. Yeah. So how should we look at the preaching of Jesus related to our preaching and teaching? What are some things that you, I know you unpack a few of these in the book, but and again, the book's Quest 52, but what are some things about the preaching of Jesus that are part of our conversation that we should consider as we think of teaching and preaching? Mm. Yeah, a couple of things just ping in my brain. One is he was a storyteller, obviously a master storyteller. If you go to Matthew 13, he tells nine parables. And if you stand on the North shore of the Lake of Galilee, he could, every one of the parables, he could point See that woman over there kneading the dough? She's, that's leaven. See that guy over there throwing seed into the field? His stories were about real life events that they had all experienced. And as a preacher myself, I know that when I talk about my own stories of living life, that always sings. Another thing that Jesus did was, and this was this is interesting, the parables of Jesus were not the only parables of Judaism. There are over 2,000 rabbinic parables what is different about Jesus' parables, unlike all, sounds like an exaggerated statement, it's just not, all the other parables of the Jews affirmed standard wisdom. They're like your bedtime stories. None of Jesus' parables affirm standard wisdom. They always exploded it. Hmm. And, and so when he tells a story, it just draws you in because stories do that, but then there's this shocking statement at the end that makes you rethink the entirety of your life. So that's one thing. Another thing about Jesus preaching is he put himself into it. And I think that took me a while to, to actually learn. I was more interested in telling people what I knew rather than talking through what I had experienced. Jesus statements in his sermons are, they are so self-referential, referential, so, I mean, cra crazy outrageous claims. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. Come to me, all you who are uh, thirsty, and I will give you rest. Uh, I tell you, I am 
I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah. Unbelievable self-referential yeah. statements, but lived and supported with the humility of the way he treated women and children and Gentiles. I think if your life shows compassion for the least and the lost, then your statements can be much bolder and life altering. Hmm. Was there something um, about Jesus, his character, his heart, that as you were researching and writing this, that it, it really impacted you? What stood out to you about Jesus's life? You know, a, a thing that, that stunned me is how little he actually engaged with Gentiles. And yet that's his last command, is to go into all the world. And what I began to see is the centrifugal nature of Jesus' teaching. So he doesn't, he doesn't overturn slavery, for example, which was a, 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 a ubiquitous institution of his day. But there's no way that you can follow the trajectory of Jesus' teaching on women or children or Gentiles and not eventually overturn slavery. So instead of trying to solve every problem in his own space and time, he gave principles that follow to their logical conclusion would have an inevitable result of changing the world. And I wanna be specific with a couple of examples. Jesus taught about servant leadership. We all know that, right? There is no servant leadership in any political figure prior to Jesus. So the fact that Great Britain has a prime minister, or in America, we have civil servants, that terminology would never make sense prior to Jesus. Hmm. Or this, we consider humility a compliment. It, it simply was not in the Greco-Roman world until he modeled it through self-deprecation and self-sacrifice. It, it had a totally different cultural value. Or this, the, the, the roles and rights of women, women were property until Jesus treated them differently and allowed even as early as, as Mary, Martha's sister, to sit at his feet. And so I, I, find, I find his teaching to be culturally explosive as much today as it was back then. So if I want to be a... Jesus-like, a Jesus-shaped church leader. You no, know, it's the Church Leaders podcast here. So if I want to be that way, because I mean, I know I've got to make hard decisions, right? I tweeted uh, a while back, you know, leaders make the hard decisions. So I got to make hard decisions. I've got to lead. I might have to, I might have to lay somebody off in difficult financial difficult times, or maybe because they're not performing well. And it's interesting because I mean, I just had a conversation with the church asking me for advice on how to how to address a staff, an underperforming staff member. And the solution was, well, that person had to be let go. But is that the way of Jesus? And how do we, I mean, where does, because we think of the way of Jesus and it's mercy is what, I mean, people often equate Jesus decisions as mercy decisions. And they are, but there's also more to that. So as a pastor and church leader, how do I live and walk as a leader in the way of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge discussion. Let me just start the conversation with this. One of the ways that I evaluate leaders is to look at what makes them angry, because that tells me what they're most passionate about. Jesus was angry only three times, and the people he were angry with, one was the Pharisees, one was his disciples, and one was the Sadducees. At each time, he got angry for the same reason. The people who were closest to him or closest to God were putting up a barrier for people farthest from God to get into God. So one of the things we have to do if, if we're going to be crystal centric leaders is to be angry at the same things that Jesus got angry about. And that means if you have an underperforming staff member who becomes a barrier between lost people coming to Jesus, they've got to go. And Jesus was not shy about that. He said to his own best friend, Peter, get behind me, Satan. He said to the Pharisees, you're a brood of vipers. He said to the, to the Sadducees that they were ignorant of the word of God. So don't pretend that Jesus is meek and mild with everybody. He, 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 was, he showed great power to the powerful 
and he showed great tenderness to those who are tender of heart. Yeah, I, I got to imagine as a Bible scholar, um, I mean, you're you're one for me. I'm I'm wondering if you're looking at trends in biblical literacy in the church. If that was one of the major reasons why you're writing this book, I mean, your your previous book, Core Fifty Two, which is a very similar format, focuses on the biblical themes and stories throughout the whole Bible. Uh, what are you seeing in trends about biblical literacy that might be alarming? Well, I'm seeing two trends in, in biblical literacy that are all that one is alarming, one is very encouraging. The alarming one, obviously, is it, it, people think jo Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a joke, but that, that was actually an answer people gave on a Bible quiz. When you don't know the scripture, you are, rem I'm, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit can't divinely give you insight into scripture, He does, but without knowing the scripture, without having the text in your heart. I mean, there was a reason that, that Deuteronomy 6 says, keep the word of God on your, on your heart and on your mind. Without that knowledge base, without that truth base, it's very difficult for the Holy Spirit to move you to make the right decisions at points of temptation or points of pain. And the, that's the discouraging part. I mean, I, I serve one of those ridiculously large churches and people come from everywhere and I'm glad they do. But if, if they don't know the word of God and have the word of God in their hearts, they might have an hour of inspiration on the weekend and then a week of temptation in between. And that's problematic. The encouraging thing is there was a study done uh, here in the Valley. It was it, uh, Valley of Phoenix. It, it involved over 200,000 people. And they ask a series of questions about quality of life. And this is actually part of the introduction of Core 52. So you can read the stats there. But if you, people who read the Bible four days a week or more, and it, it could be five minutes, 10 minutes, you read the Bible on your own four days a week or more, sexual immorality in that category of people drops by 60%. The use of pornography drops by 60%. Gambling addictions drop by 75%. Drunkenness drops by over 50%. The real life consequences of biblical illiteracy are addictions, depression, isolation, and mental illness. The, uh, there were some surveys done during COVID on the mental health crisis, and they found that every single demographic in America both genders, political parties, economic strata, everybody's mental health went down, save one group of people. And that's those who go to church weekly. And that has to do with connection to biblical truth. It's good for your mind. It's good for your body. It's good for your relationships. That's why well, it matters so much to me. Yeah. And we would, we'd all agree that it doesn't preclude those things. I mean, you can still experience yep. some of those struggles, but I, but I, I think that one of the things I love just watching you teach. So again, we <laughs> we went uh, we went all over the place, and you loved bringing surprising truths, and and it was sort of fun. We had a couple of students who were there's you know there's depending on your tradition, there are ameners. Our students are more ahas. You know, they're like, yeah, aha. So I heard that several times. Uh, one of our students in particular, Wit, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, oh, yeah, he yeah. Would, he would say, oh, you know, and you'd hear those. And so you've given several examples, but I want you to give a couple of more. Some unexpected truths uh, about Jesus. And again, it's, it's in Quest 52. Quest 52 is the book. It's a 15-minute-a-day, year-long pursuit of Jesus. So what are some other unexpected truths people would encounter here in the book, but just that we need to know about Jesus? Jesus had the ability in a, in a short span of time to alter not just your perceptions, but the perception of religion to overall. So here's, here's an example. If you just went to the Sermon on the Mount, it takes 17 minutes to recite out loud. You will find five times in 17 minutes, the world of religion altered. Here's one of the first ones. In chapter 5, verse 20, he said, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And we think, what? The Pharisees, they, like, they fasted twice a week. I, I'm not going to do that. They prayed three times a day. I'm not going to do that. They, they tithe of their dill seed. I'm going to do that. 
Jesus is not asking for more righteousness. He's asking for deeper righteousness. Mm -hmm. And the first time in the history of religion, he dealt with your motives. It's not enough not just to not commit adultery. It's the heart in you that doesn't look at a woman lustfully. Or it's not enough not to murder somebody. It's the heart in you that doesn't harbor anger against the other. That the Jesus' ability to alter all of religion is stunning. But the one that, that has made the most difference in my life personally is one word in the Lord's Prayer. And Ed, you'll remember the Jesus seminar that was voting with beads for the authenticity of Jesus' statement. Of all the Lord's Prayer, there's only one word that they kept in red, and it was the word Father. <laughs> 276 times this word that God is called Father in all the Bible. Only three of those are in the Old Testament. Oh, well. And it, it's not a personal Father. It's like the Father of the nation. So you have three times in the Old Testament, 273 times in the New Testament. And then I track the numbers through Paul. And this... Like this was, you got to be kidding me, 76 times Paul called, called God Father, but 73 of the 76 times he connected it to Jesus. Hmm. It was as if the Apostle Paul didn't have, like he was uncomfortable calling God Father without saying, well, Jesus told me to say this, like is, is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That to me shows the power of that single transition God is not just a distant deity. He is a loving father. And oh, man, if I could teach one thing for the rest of my life, if I had one sermon to give, I would talk about God as your father, because mm. so many abused women, their lives in our church have been turned right side up because of a father who loves them. And so many abandoned boys have, their lives have been put aright because they got the idea that God is their father. Jesus did that five times in 17 minutes. I mean, come on. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Again, I mean, some of this is from Mark's book, Quest 52. Uh, Mark, our, our listeners, our pastors and church leaders, uh, how can they use Quest 52 to help their church members, uh, again, better understand Jesus and, and, and the Bible? Well, I, I've designed the whole book for small groups because we, we do better in circles rather than rows. So if they do pick up the book and maybe they'll read through it and see if it's something they want to use for, for group material, but there's discussion questions in every chapter, ready-made. So I know around here, when we recruit leaders for groups, sometimes they're going, oh, I'd, I would do it, but I don't know the Bible. Look, you don't have to know the Bible at all. And if you go to quest52.org, I've done a like a six-minute teaching video to kick off groups I just walk through the material and I do that for guys, especially because a guy's not going to play a game he can't win. So if I haven't read the book, I might skip the group. So this keeps them from doing that. There's That's no cool. excuses for not leading a group and there's no excuses for not coming to a group. The material's there, the question's there and an applicant is the most important day five. There's an application. Here's how you can implement the principle of that week in, in your life. You're listening to Dr. Mark E. Moore. You can learn more about him at markmore with an e.org. And don't forget to check That's out his book. That's why you got to say the Mark E. That's, That's right. Yeah. Mark E, not Mark, Mark E. Mark. Or Mark <laughs> Moore with an E. Mark, yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, there you go. With an E. You can check out his book, Quest 52, a 15 minute a day year long pursuit of Jesus. Uh, you can do, do that at Amazon and other book outlets. You can find more interviews with Assessor uh, Church Leaders podcast, as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. If you found our conversation helpful today, we'd love for you to take a few you moments. Know, they, don't, they don't do that. Like, there's Leave not a lot review. of people leaving. We've got great listeners. We've got a few. But we've, we've got, got a few. few. We need more reviews. <laughs> we'd love to hear more from so you. We need to have reviews. Please help us because it gets the word out. That's right. Helps other ministry leaders find us uh, in, in much more faster. So thanks again for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.